The Ancient Secret of the Flower of Life by Drunvelo Melchizedek, Volume 1 Chapter 4, The Aborted Evolution of Consciousness and the Creation of the Christ Grid, How the Lemurians Evolved Human Consciousness The immortal beings of Lemuria flew from their homeland to a little island north of the newly risen continent of Atlantis. They waited for a long time on the island they named Judal. Then they began to recreate their spiritual science. If you had watched them, you wouldn't have known what the heck they were doing, you'd have thought they were nuts. In order to describe what they were doing, I have to describe something else first. The structure of the human brain. This circle, figure 41, represents a human head, looking down from above. There's the nose, N. The human brain are divided into two components the left side and the right side. In figure 42, the left side is male and the right side is female, and they are linked by the corpus callosum. According to Thoth, this is the nature of these two hemispheres, the left, male component sees everything absolutely logically, as it is, you might say, the right, female component is much more concerned with experiencing something than understanding it. The female and male perceptions are mirror images of each other, as if you had a mirror between them. If you had the word love written into the male component, he would see it as shown. But the female sees its mirror image, also as shown. When the male looks at her way of perceiving, he says, there's no logic here. She looks at him and says, where is the feeling? The brain is further divided into four lobes by another thin division. The male side of the brain has a component behind it that reflects, or mirrors the front, as shown in figure 43. There's another mirror image behind the female side that reflects what's in front of it. The male logical component has a totally experiential component behind it and the female experiential component has totally logical component behind it. It's as if there are four mirrors reflecting each other in these four possible ways. When we look at the geometries later, you'll see that the forward part in the male brain, the logical component, is based on the triangle and the square, in two dimensions, or the tetrahedron and the cube, in three dimensions. The forward part in the female brain, the experiential component, is based on the triangle and the pentagon, in two dimensions, or the tetrahedron, the icosahedron and the dodecahedron, in three dimensions. There are also diagonal pathways connecting the left, front logical to the back, right logical, and the right, front experiential to the back, left experiential. Thus the mirror quality reflects side to side, front to back, and diagonal to diagonal. This is the way we're made up, according to Thoth. The attempt to birth a new consciousness on Atlantis. When the time was right, the knuckles from Lemuria created a spiritual representation of a human brain on the surface of their Atlantean island. Their purpose was to birth a new consciousness based on what they had learned during Lemuria. They believed the brain had to come first before the body of the new consciousness of Atlantis was to emerge. With Thoth's image of the human brain in mind, you can begin to make sense of their actions. First they made a wall down the middle of the island about 40 feet high and 20 feet wide which sealed off one side of the island from the other. Literally, you had to go into the water to get to the other side. Then they ran a minor wall across at 90 degrees to the first wall, which divided the island into four parts. Then half of these thousand people, who were of the Knackle Mystery School, went on one side and half stayed on the other, depending on their nature. That could mean that all the women stayed on one side and all the men went to the other side, but as I understand it, where a person went did not depend on the physical body, but his or her dependency on one side of the brain or the other. In this way, approximately half became the male component of the brain and the other half became the female component. They spent thousands of years in this physical state until they believed they were ready for the next step. Three people were selected to represent the corpus callosum, the part of the brain that links the left and right hemispheres together. Thoth's father, Tum, was one of these. He and two other people were the only ones allowed to go everywhere on the island. Otherwise, the two sides had to remain completely separate from each other. Then the three began to align their energies and thoughts and feelings and all aspects of humanness into an integrated human brain, not with human cells, but rather with human bodies. 
The next step was to project onto the surface of Atlantis the form of the Tree of Life. They used the form here, figure 44, with 12 circles on it instead of 10, but the 11th and 12th circles were off the mainland, one of the points was on Noodle and one was in the water to the south, so there were 10 components on the mainland, which is the configuration we're familiar with, even though it extended over hundreds of miles on the surface of this land. They projected it to the accuracy of a single atom, according to Thoth. There is an indication that even the spheres of the Tree of Life were used to designate the size and shape of the cities of Atlantis. Plato says in his book, Crishas, that the main city of Atlantis was made of three rings of land separated by water, as shown in this drawing, figure 4-5. He also says the city was constructed of red black and white stones. This last statement will make sense as soon as we talk about the Great Pyramid. The children of Lemuria are called forth. Suddenly, in a single day, the brain of Atlantis, the Nacal Mystery School, breathed life into the tree of life on the surface of Atlantis. This created vortexes of energy rotating out of each of the circles on the tree of life. Once the vortexes were established, then the brain of Atlantis psychically called forth the children of Lemuria, millions and millions of Lemurians, who by then had settled along the west coast of North and South America and in other places, began to be pulled to Atlantis. A great migration began, and the ordinary people of the sunken Lemuria started moving toward Atlantis. Remember, they were feminine right-brained beings and inner communication was easy. However, the Lemurian body of consciousness had reached only the age of twelve as a planetary consciousness. It was still a child, and some of its centers weren't functioning yet. They had worked with those energies and had mastered only eight of the ten. So each migrating Lemurian was attracted to one of these eight centers on Atlantis, depending on the nature of the individual. There they settled and began to build cities that left two vortexes with nobody using them, not a single person. These two vortexes were pulling life toward them, and in life you just can't have an empty place. Life will find a way to fill it. For instance, if you're driving along the freeway following another car and you drop too far behind it, somebody will fill in the gap, right? If you leave a place empty, life will step in and fill it. That's exactly what happened on Atlantis. Though Lemurians settled into only eight of the vortex areas, Mayan records state clearly that there were ten cities in Atlantis when it fell. In fact, you can see those records in the Troana document, which is now located in the British Museum. This document is estimated to be at least 3,500 years old and it describes in detail the sinking of Atlantis. It's Mayan, and it contains an authentic account of the cataclysm, according to Laplongeon, the French historian who translated it. Here is what it says, in the year 6 can on the 11th Maluk in the month Zak, there occurred terrible earthquakes which continued without interruption until the 13th Chin. The country of the hills of mud, the land of Mew, was sacrificed being twice upheaved. It suddenly disappeared during one night, the basin being continually shaken by volcanic forces. Being confined, these caused the land to sink and to rise several times and in various places. At last the surface gave way, and ten countries were torn asunder and scattered, unable to stand the forces of the convulsions. They sank with their 64 million inhabitants. The ten countries mentioned were referring to the ten points on the tree of life. When you see this document, it shows an extremely sophisticated city with volcanoes going off inside and all around it, pyramids and everything else being destroyed and people getting in boats and trying to escape. It describes the incident in the Mayan language, which uses pictures the aborted evolution. Two empty vortexes drew extraterrestrial races. To fill those two empty vortexes, according to Thoth, two extraterrestrial races stepped in, not one, but two completely different races. The first race was the Hebrews, coming from our future. Thoth says they came from off the planet, but I don't know specifically where. The Hebrews were kind of like a kid who went through the fifth grade and didn't make it and had to do that grade over again. They hadn't graduated to the next level of evolution, so they had to repeat that grade. In other words, 
They were like a child who had already been through the math stuff. They knew a lot of things that we didn't know yet. They had legal permission from the Galactic Command to step into our revolutionary path at that time. They brought with them, according to Thoth, many concepts and ideas that we had no idea about yet because we hadn't entered into those levels of awareness. This interaction actually benefited our evolution. I believe there was no problem with their coming to earth and settling. There probably would have been no problem at all if just this one race had come here. The other race that stepped in at that time caused big problems. These beings came from the nearby planet of Mars. I know this may sound strange, but it sounded even stranger when I was saying this back in 1985 before people like Richard Hoagland began to speak up, it has become evident because of the situation that has developed in the world, that this same race is still causing major problems. The secret government and the trillionaires of the world are of Mars extraction or have mostly Martian genes and little or no emotional, feeling body. Mars after the Lucifer rebellion. According to Thoth, Mars looked much like Earth a little less than a million years ago. It was beautiful. It had oceans and water and trees and was just fantastic. But then something happened to them and it had to do with the past Lucifer rebellion. From the very beginning of this experiment we are in, and all of God's creation is an experiment, experiments similar to the Lucifer rebellion, if you want to call them rebellions, have been attempted four times. In other words, three other beings besides Lucifer attempted to do the same thing, and each time it resulted in utter chaos throughout the universe. More than a million years ago, the Martians had joined the third rebellion. The third time that life decided to try this experiment, and the experiment failed dramatically. Planets everywhere were destroyed, and Mars was one of them. Life attempted to create a separate reality from God, which is the same thing that's going on now. In other words, a portion of life attempted to separate itself from all other life and create its own separate reality. Since everyone is God anyway, this is okay. You can do that. The only thing is, it never has worked so far. Nevertheless, they tried it again. When someone tries to separate from God, they sever their love connection with reality. So when the Martians, and many others, created a separate reality, they cut the love bond, they disconnected the emotional body, and in so doing they became pure male, with little or no female within them. They were purely logical beings with no emotions. Like Mr. Spock in Star Trek, they were pure logic. What happened in Mars, and in thousands and thousands of other places, was that they ended up fighting all the time because there was no compassion, no love. Mars became a battleground that just kept going on and on and on, until finally it became clear that Mars was not going to survive. Eventually they blew their atmosphere away and destroyed the surface of their planet. Before Mars was destroyed, they built huge tetrahedral pyramids, which you're going to see in photographs in the second volume. Then they built three-sided, four-sided, and five-sided pyramids, eventually building a complex that was able to create a synthetic Merkabah, you see. You can have a space-time vehicle that looks like a spaceship, or you can have certain other structures that do the same thing. They built a structure from which they were able to look ahead and behind in time and space to tremendous distances and time periods. A small group of Martians tried to get away from Mars before it was destroyed, so they translated themselves into the future and found a perfect place to resettle before Mars was destroyed. That place was Earth but it was about 65,000 years in our past. They saw that little vortex sitting there on Atlantis with nobody in it. They didn't ask permission. Being part of the rebellion, they didn't go through the normal procedure. They just said, all right, let's do it. They stepped right into that vortex, and in so doing, they joined our evolutionary path. Martians rape the human child consciousness and take over. There were only a few thousand of these Martians who actually used the time-space dimension consciousness machine, or building. The very first thing they did when they arrived here on Earth was try to take control of Atlantis. They wanted to declare war and take over. However, they were vulnerable because of their small numbers and perhaps other reasons so they couldn't do it. They were finally subdued by the Atlanteans Lemurians. We were able to stop them from conquering us, 
but we could not send them back. By the time this took place in our evolutionary path, we were about the age of a 14 year old girl. So what you had here was similar to a 14 year old girl being taken over by a much older man, a 60 or 70 year old man who simply forced himself on her. In other words, it was rape. We were raped, we had no choice. The Martians just stepped in and said, like it or not, we're here. They didn't care what we thought or felt about it. It was really no different from what we in America did to the Native Americans. Once the initial conflict was over, it was agreed that the Martians would try to understand this female thing they lacked, this emotional feeling, of which they had none at all. Things more or less settled down for a long time. But the Martians slowly began to implement their left brain technology, which the Lemurians didn't know anything about. All the Lemurians knew was right brain technology, which today we know very little about. Psychotronic machines, dowsing rods and those kinds of things are right brain technologies. Many right brain feminine technologies would astound you if you saw them in action. You can do absolutely anything that you can imagine with right brain technology, just as you can with left brain technology if they are brought to their full potential. But then we really do not need either one, this is the great secret that we have forgotten. The Martians kept putting out these left brain inventions, one after another after another, until finally they changed the polarity of our evolutionary path because we began to see through the left brain, and we changed from female to male. We changed the nature of who we were. The Martians gained control bit by bit until eventually they controlled everything without a battle. They had all the money and all the power. The animosity between the Martians and the Lemurians, and I'm putting the Hebrews in with the Lemurians, never subsided, not even to the very end of Atlantis. They hated each other. The Lemurians, the feminine aspect, were basically shoved down and treated like inferiors. It was not a very loving situation. It was a marriage that the female component did not like. But I don't think the Martian males really cared if she liked it or not. It remained this way for a very long time, until approximately 26,000 years ago, when the next phase slowly began. Minor pole shift and the subsequent debate. It was about 26,000 years ago when we had another minor pole shift and a small change in consciousness. This pole shift took place at the same point on the polar wobble called the precession of the equinoxes that we have now returned to, see the lower small oval at A in figure 4-6. It wasn't much though it has been recorded by science. The two small ovals on the cycle are where these changes always take place, and right now we're back at point A again. At the time of this pole shift, a piece of Atlantis, probably about half the size of Rhode Island, sank into the ocean. That caused a tremendous amount of fear in Atlantis, because they thought they were going to lose the whole continent like what happened to Lemuria. By this time they had lost most of their ability to see into the future. They were shaking in their boots for a long time simply because they didn't know for sure what was going to happen. They were still afraid a hundred years later, then slowly this fear began to subside. It took over two hundred years for them to feel safe again. Atlantis was a little beyond the lower oval at A when they finally relaxed their fear about earth changes. But the memory was still there. They were going along nicely for a while, then out of the blue approximately 13,000 to 16,000 years ago, a comet approached earth. When this comet was still in deep space, the Atlanteans knew about it because they were more technologically advanced than we are now. They witnessed its approach. A great conflict began to occur in Atlantis. The Martians, who were in the minority even though they were in control, wanted to blow it out of the sky with their laser technology. But there was a huge movement amongst the Lemurian population against using the Martian left-brained technology. The feminine aspect said, this comet is in divine order, and we should allow this to take place naturally. Let it hit the earth. That is what's supposed to take place. Of course, the Martians replied, no. Let's blow it out of the sky. We have very little time, or we all will be killed. After lots of arguing, the Martians finally and reluctantly agreed to allow the comet to hit the earth. When it arrived, it came screaming into the atmosphere plunging into the Atlantic Ocean just off the western shore of Atlantis near where Charleston, South Carolina, is now, 
Only it was on the bottom of the ocean then. The remnants of that comet are now scattered over for states. Science has definitely determined that it did hit there somewhere between 13,000 and 16,000 years ago. They're still finding pieces. Although most of the fragments were centered near Charleston, one of the two largest pieces actually struck the main body of Atlantis in its southwestern area. These left two huge holes in the floor of the Atlantic Ocean and could have been the true cause of the sinking of Atlantis. The actual sinking did not happen at that time, but took place at least several hundred years later. The Martians' fateful decision. The pieces of the comet that crashed into the southwestern area of Atlantis happened to be right where the Martians were living killing a huge portion of their population. The Martians got hurt the worst by consenting to allow the comet to come in. Well, that was too humiliating and painful for them. This was the beginning of a great loss of consciousness for Earth. What was about to take place was the seed for a bitter tree, the same tree we live by today. The Martians said, it's all over. We are divorcing you. We're going to do whatever we want from now on. You can do whatever you want but we're going to lead our own lives and try to control our own fate, and we're not going to listen to you ever again. You know this whole number. We've seen it in divorced families throughout the world. And the children? Look at our world. We are the children. The Martians decided to take over the Earth. Of course. Control, the Martians' primary interface with the reality rose to meet their anger. They began to create a building complex like the one they had constructed on Mars a long time earlier, in order to create a synthetic Merkabah once again. The only thing is, around 50,000 Earth years had passed since they had created one, and they didn't remember exactly how to do it, but they thought they did. So they built the buildings and began the experiment. That experiment is directly tied to a chain of Merkabahs that began with the Mars experiments a little less than a million years before. Later, one was done here on Earth in 1913, another one in 1943, called the Philadelphia Experiment, another one in 1983, called the Montauk Experiment, and another one that, I believe, they're attempting to do this year. 1993, nearby Many Island. These dates are windows of time that open up and are tied to the harmonics of the situation. The experiments must be timed to these windows in order to succeed. If the Martians had succeeded in setting up a synthetic harmonic Merkabah, they would have had absolute control of the planet, if that was their intention. They would have been able to make anybody on the planet do anything they wanted though eventually it would have meant their own demise. No higher order being would place this kind of control on another if they truly understood the reality. Failure of the Martian Merkabah attempt. The Martians built the buildings in Atlantis, set up the whole experiment, then threw their switch to begin the energy flow. Almost immediately they lost control of the experiment, like falling through space and time. The degree of destruction was more horrible and sinful than I care to describe. In this reality, you can hardly make a greater error than to create an out-of-control synthetic Merkabah. What the experiment did was begin to rip open the lower dimensional levels of the Earth. Not the higher ones, but the lower ones. To give an analogy, the human body has membranes between different parts, such as in the heart, the stomach, the liver, the eyes and so on. If you took a knife and silt open your stomach, that would be like ripping open the dimensional levels of the earth. Various aspects are separated from other aspects of spirit by these dimensional membranes, and they're not meant to mix. You're not supposed to have blood in your stomach, but in your arteries. The purpose of a blood cell is different from that of a stomach cell. These Martians did something that almost killed the earth. The environmental disaster we are experiencing today is nothing in comparison, though the problems we are having are a direct result of what we did long ago. With the right understanding and enough love, the environment could be repaired in a single day. But had this Martian experiment continued, it would have destroyed the earth forever. We would never have been able to use the earth as a seed base again. The Martians made a very, very serious mistake. This out of control Merkabah field, first of all, released a huge number of lower dimensional spirits into the Earth's higher dimensional planes. These spirits were forced into a world they did not understand or know, and were in total fear. They had to live, they had to have bodies, 
so they went right into people, hundreds of them into each person in Atlantis. The Atlanteans could not stop them from entering their bodies. Finally, almost every person in the world was totally possessed by these beings from another dimension. These spirits were really earthlings like us, but very different, not coming from this dimension level. It was a total catastrophe, the biggest catastrophe the earth has probably ever seen. A disruptive heritage. The Bermuda Triangle. The Martians attempt to control the world took place near one of the Atlantean islands in the area we now call the Bermuda Triangle. There's an actual building sitting on the ocean floor down there that contains three rotating star tetrahedral electromagnetic fields superimposed on each other, creating a huge synthetic Merkabah that stretches out over the ocean and into deep space. This Merkabah is completely out of control. It's called the Bermuda Triangle because the apex of one of the tetrahedrons, the stationary one, is sticking up out of the water there. The other two fields, are counter-rotating, and the faster rotating field sometimes moves clockwise, which is a very dangerous situation. When we say clockwise, we mean the source of the field, not the field itself. The field itself would appear to be rotating counterclockwise. You'll understand this when you learn more about the Merkabah. When the faster field rotates counterclockwise, from its source, everything's okay, but when the faster one moves clockwise, from its source, that's when time and space distortions happen. Many of the airplanes and ships that have disappeared in the Bermuda Triangle have literally gone into other dimensional levels because of the out of control field there. A primary cause of much of the distortion in the world. The distortion between humans such as wars, marital problems, emotional disturbances etc., is that imbalanced field. That field is not only causing distortions on earth, it's causing distortions way, way, way out in remote areas of space because of the way reality is constructed. That's one of the reasons why this race of beings called the greys, and other ET beings well talk about at the appropriate time are trying to correct what happened here long ago. This is a big problem that extends way beyond Earth. What they did back Atlantis was against all galactic law. It was illegal, but they did it anyway. It will be solved, but not until the year 2012. There's not much the ETs can do in the meantime, but they'll probably keep trying. Eventually they'll succeed.